Okay, so today and tomorrow we're going to talk about organizing matter. So this is going to be the very first day that's actually going to feel more like a real chemistry lesson. Uh, there's two separate ways we organize matter. We'll focus on only one of those two ways today and we'll do the other uh, one of those two ways tomorrow. Uh, so again, we're going to spend today and tomorrow running through a fair amount of new information. We're going to talk about physical properties of matter, chemical properties of matter, pure substances versus mixed substances, and physical changes versus chemical changes. Now, again, this is the plan, really should say today and tomorrow's plan. Um, we'll cover about half of that stuff today. Uh, so first things first, just kind of an intro to this to wake your mind up and get you thinking about this a little bit more. Uh, in terms of organizing matter, uh, in what ways could we organize the following images right here? I want you to just pause the video here and think up as many different ways that you could organize all of these different shapes that you see uh, by some sort of categorical methods, so some sort of category. Okay, so what I would say is one way, I think an obvious way, at least in my mind, uh, would be to organize them by color, right? So you could separate them uh, into blue ones versus green ones. Uh, another way, of course, you could organize them are into shapes, right? So you could say the ones that are circles versus the ones that are rectangles versus the ones that are stars. Um, I'm sure there's probably some other ways you could organize this, but just off the top of my head, I think that's really the only the two ways you could do it. I guess you could do both shapes and colors at the same time. So have all the green circles together and all the blue circles in another group and, and so on. Uh, but the point is there's different qualities that we see in these shapes uh, that we can use to uh, organize them into certain groups. Uh, and that's kind of the idea that we're going to get into with chemistry here. So here we go. Uh, so one way we can organize matter is by their physical properties, right? Uh, so kind of like that example we just looked at, a physical property is just basically the physical appearance and or composition of the substance. Uh, so when I say the word appearance, I'm just obviously talking about what it looks like. But when I say composition, what I mean is what is it made of, right? So you can organize matter based off of either of those things, just based off what it looks like, what color it is, for instance, or, or how shiny it is or anything like that. Uh, or you can organize it based on its composition. In other words, what actually makes up that type of matter. Uh, now to determine physical properties, you just use your five senses, right? So you use your eyes to see it. You can use your ears, like what does it sound like? And if that sounds kind of silly, well, put it this way, different metals, when you drop them on different surfaces will actually have different sounds. Uh, they say that if you take old coins, especially old nickels, and compare them to modern nickels, uh, if you drop it on a table, those two different nickels will make different sounds. That's because they're made of different metals that change what nickels have been made of uh, as time has gone on. Uh, smell is another obvious one. Uh, feel, right? So some things, are they, are they smooth? Are they rough? Those are, of course, some physical properties. Uh, and then taste, not so much in a science lab setting, of course, but taste is another way of... Uh, basically testing some physical properties. Is it salty? Is it sweet? Those sort of things, right? Uh, you can also use numerical descriptions. So things like its density, uh, its melting point, its boiling point, etc. Those are all physical properties. They are actual like things you can observe about a certain type of matter. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Uh, another way to organize matter, a very simple way, if you ask me, is just into metals versus nonmetals. This will become a lot more important as this unit goes on. Um, metals and nonmetals, while it seems like a very silly difference, they're actually a really important distinction between the two uh, because they can be used to form different kinds of compounds, which we'll get into later on. But again, you can organize matter into just simply stuff that are metal and stuff that's not metal, right? Uh, now, another way or another reason why separating things into metals versus nonmetals is important is because metals actually share similar physical properties. It doesn't matter what type of metal you're dealing with, whether it's gold up in the top right hand corner or copper in the bottom right corner or aluminum in the bottom left corner. Uh, all metals share some very similar properties. Uh, metals are always shiny, of course, unless they get smudged up by something. But basically, we mean they can be they can be polished into becoming shiny. Right. All metals can do that. Uh, metals are also malleable. This is just a fancy way of saying they can be rolled into sheets. Uh, now, the way I always remember that is uh, malleable is kind of like the word mallet, right? A mallet is a type of hammer. So in other words, in order to get it into a sheet, maybe someone's like struck it with a hammer, they malleted it or malleable. I, I don't know. I'm just coming up with stuff here. But uh, basically malleable, you do need to know what that word means. It just means it can be rolled into sheets. Uh, ductile is another feature of metals. All metals are to some extent ductile. 
Ductile just means it can be stretched into a long wire. Um, I know some people are all like, oh, it kind of sounds like duck tail. And that's a, a, a long wire. I don't I have no idea. Again, I'm just coming up with stuff here. So do, do whatever you want. You have to memorize these two words, though, for sure. You have to understand that as a vocab term. Malleable means it's rolled into sheets. Ductile means it can be stretched into a long wire. So copper, of course, is very ductile. It's quite easy to get copper to be stretched into a wire. Uh, but all metals can be made into wire, even gold. Uh, the last one, this is a huge one later on at least, uh, metals always conduct electricity. Certain metals conduct electricity better, better than others. They'll have a lower resistance if we want to go back to what we learned in the electricity unit. Uh, but all metals will always conduct electricity, just to varying extents. Uh, now, non-metals also share similar physical properties. Uh, they're dull, and by, by what we mean by dull is just not shiny, right? So non-metals are not shiny, they are dull. Uh, they are brittle, which basically means they can be broken into either a powder or cracked into like different chunks, basically. Um, and they don't act like a metal. So in other words, they're not malleable, they're not ductile, and they're not conductive, uh, generally speaking, at least. Uh, so another way, yet another way, I should say, to organize matter uh, is into pure substances versus mixed substances. Uh, let's get into the definition of each one of these right here. So a pure substance is made of only one kind of matter. Uh, now, when we say one kind of matter, we could be as pure as we possibly can get and say literally just one kind of element. Now, uh, an element is just something that can't be broken down into other substances. Uh, you can just take a look at a periodic table, which you guys will get a printed copy uh, in class pretty soon, and we'll We'll be going through the periodic table in quite great detail as time goes on. Uh, but an element, of course, is a pure substance. It's about as pure of a substance as you can get. Some examples of elements, of course, are silver, that's what this is here, uh, or mercury, which is what this uh, liquid metal is right here. Uh, another thing that a pure substance could be is a compound. Now, a compound is just a chemical combination of two or more elements. Uh, probably the easiest compound to think of is water. Water is made up of two hydrogens and one oxygen. So hydrogen and oxygen are each elements. They combined chemically to form H2O, or in other words, water. Uh, another good example of a compound is table salt. Table salt is sodium, which is Na. Don't ask me why it's Na and not like SO for sodium, but it's, it stands for it in a different language, I believe. But anyway, Na is sodium, uh, and it's combined with chlorine, which is Cl. So NaCl, sodium chloride, that is just a fancy way of saying table salt. So because they are chemically combined, two different elements chemically combined, that makes a compound. So water and salt, both are compounds and they are what we would call pure substances. Anyway, moving on. Uh, mixed substances, buckle up here because there's tons of different types of mixed substances. So it can be really broken down into even more categories here. Uh, a mixed substance is a combination of pure substances. There's four different types. The first type, and this is the easiest one to remember in my opinion, is something called a mechanical mixture. A mechanical mixture is just where all of the different substances are visible. So it's a mixture of things where you haven't lost sight of all your different things. Uh, sometimes, uh, in, in chemistry at least, uh, we call mechanical mixture a heterogeneous mixture. That just basically means it's a mixture of different things. The word hetero means different. Uh, so a classic example of a mechanical mixture, the one that I really like using all the time, uh, is trail mix, right? So clearly this is a mechanical mixture because you can see all of the different substances that make it up. You can see that there are pretzels, there's M&Ms, there's peanuts, looks like there's raisins in here. Uh, the main idea though is all of those different components are visible. Anyway, moving on. Uh, a solution. A solution is a mixture of two or more pure substances that look like one substance. These are the most devious of all of them because it's it's often thought that uh, a solution could end up being a pure substance, but it actually isn't. You can't see the component parts of this. Uh, sometimes instead of the word solution, we call it a homogeneous solution. Remember the word homo means same. So that just means it looks like one same thing, um, but it's actually not. It's something that's dissolved in something else. So that's a mixed substance. Uh, so an example, if you had some sort of a solid and you mix it in with a liquid and the solid was just mixed in, like it dissolved in, that's that's a solution, right? So it's not a pure substance, it's a mixed substance because it's still made up of a bunch of different things that are not chemically bound together. Really important distinction. Uh, so I guess one example of this would be if you took like 
sugar or like a sugar mix, like iced tea mix or something, and you mix it with water, that makes a uh, homogeneous solution. It's not a pure substance. Iced tea is not pure. It's, uh, it's actually a mixed substance. Anyway, moving on. Uh, number three, this is where it gets even more confusing, but don't worry, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna really assess you too much on this. Uh, the third type of mixed substance is a suspension. A suspension is just where tiny particles are held in another substance uh, and they can be separated out. Now, usually suspensions involve two substances of different states of matter. That's really important. That helps us really identify when we have a suspension. Uh, so for an example, a solid that is mixed in with a liquid. Now, the key idea here is a suspension is when you can actually physically separate it out. Uh, so it wouldn't necessarily be like something dissolving in water because that's not going to separate unless it, unless it really poorly dissolved. Um, but it's something that's going to separate on its own over time. Uh, I think the easiest uh, example of a suspension for me uh, is always a muddy river, right? The river is muddy because there's little pieces of dirt that's floating around in it. If you took a scoop of that water and put it in a bucket and left that bucket to sit for a while, eventually all of that dirt's going to sink down to the bottom. Uh, so in other words, the dirt was just suspended in the water. So it's a solid, that would be the dirt, uh, suspended in the water, which is, of course, the liquid. Uh, another good example of a suspension I've heard before is like stuff that comes out of an aerosol can, uh, especially when it's like uh, like an air freshener or, or perfume. Well, perfume is not really the best example, but, but an air freshener would be a good example. Uh, it's because there's liquid droplets suspended in a gas. That would be a good example of a suspension. Oh, another good example of a suspension that just kind of clicked with me right now, uh, smoke. Smoke is actually solid bits of ash floating in a gas. That would make it a suspension. At least I'm pretty sure. Could also be the next thing. Uh, so I might have to get back to you on that. But the next thing is called a colloid. A colloid is very similar to suspension. Oftentimes it's hard to tell the difference between a suspension and a colloid. Uh, but a colloid is just where the particles are very, very small and can't be separated easily. So upon second thought here, smoke might actually be a better example of a colloid than a suspension. It still involves things that are suspended in something, but they're very, very, very small and they can't be separated out very easily. Uh, if smoke isn't an example of a colloid though, here's two others. Uh, paint is an example of a colloid because there's actually very, very, very small paint particles uh, that are floating in the water-based solution or oil-based solution as some paints are. <coughs> excuse me, or uh, another really classic example of a colloid is milk. Uh, milk is made up of several different little particles that are floating in, well, a water-based solution, um, and they can't be separated out very easily. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the only ways you can really separate those particles out of milk uh, is by boiling it out, uh, which of course would remove all the excess water, and then you're just left with all the clumpy uh, evaporated milk is what they call that left over. Anyway, I feel like I've just been rambling nonstop at you guys for almost 14 minutes here. Uh, so the good news is we're done for today. All I need you to do as a task is I need you to take out a piece of paper or, or something inside your notebooklet, ideally inside your binder, or if you have a coil book, whatever. And I need you to copy this diagram exactly how it is into your notes. What it's doing is it's breaking down matter into pure substances and mixed substances. Uh, and then it's understanding that pure substances are made up of elements and compounds and mixtures are made up of mechanical mixtures, solutions, suspensions, and colloids. So just copy this into your notes. As soon as you've got this copy into your notes, just return back to the Zoom and tell me that you're all done for today. Uh, and then you are good to go and we'll continue this, uh, this discussion in tomorrow's video. See you later.